this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to this fifth episode of Lawyer On Air. I'm Catherine O'Connell. Today I'm joined by Robin Nadler, who is a foreign lawyer in Tokyo. Robin is an amazing lawyer and her career has traveled to many places. She was born and raised in Australia and qualified in New South Wales in 1988, England and Wales in 1996, and New York in 2003. Robin has lived in Japan the past 20 years, working in a variety of international law firms and financial institutions. She started her career in the area of cross-border security offerings, but in recent years, she's been focusing on fintech regulations. For her clients, she offers her specialist advice in compliance and regulatory, and she makes sense of the array of financial regulations such as electronic money payments. I haven't had someone on the show so far who is a master in compliance, and sometimes I think compliance and regulatory work is relegated to the poorer cousin of law and not really given the prestige it deserves. I think it's quietly a sexy area of the law to specialize in. And if you make your mark, you can carve out a name as a specialist in this field, as Robin has. Robin is one of the few in Japan who really has taken on fintech regulatory and compliance and made it her niche, especially in what is to me a mind-boggling finance and e-money area. Um, And her experience on secondment to one of the, well, many of the 10, top 10 fintech payment companies was really significant, I think, in giving her a hands-on experience at the coalface. Well, I think we first met, uh, Robin and I first met when I, when she was on secondment. I think she was on secondment from a large international firm in Tokyo to a Japanese company. And I actually interviewed uh, for the role that she was uh, leaving at that time. And I'm fully of the belief that if something is not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And though I did not get that role, uh, it was for the better because of that experience, I took down myself down uh, other paths and had other adventures. And also from that time, I was really thankful to Robin for thinking of putting my name forward and really grateful that I could get to know another super lawyer in Tokyo. I might add that Robin's husband is also an amazing lawyer in Tokyo, and he has taken me under his wing in the last several years since I launched my business, and I consider him a great mentor and colleague. Robin is a straight shooter, and what you see is what you get, and uh, she's also very kind and always ready to help others. I know that when we talk today, Robin will get straight to it and not sugarcoat anything, and I've just loved witnessing her grow her career and admired her eldership in the community. So I'm super proud to have her as my guest today. So Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm delighted to be here at last. (laughs) (laughs) It is so wonderful. And today we're going to be talking about your career, how you navigated your career in Japan with international big law, Japan big law, your secondments, how you've carved out this really nice field in fintech and compliance and some of the challenges you may have overcome. Um, I'd love to also talk about the future of law and have you offer up some gems of advice for young lawyers on their career path. How does that sound? Sounds great. Great. Well, today we are talking online. The state of emergency, I think it's the third one, is continuing in Japan. But if we were meeting up in person, Robin, where would we be? Do you have a a favorite wine bar or a a restaurant that you love to go to? And what would you be choosing off the menu? (laughs) Well, I'm going to make a little bit of a plug here because I would, well, I would genuinely like to go to Cicada, which is one of my favorite restaurants um, located in Aoyama. Uh, I would like to have a glass of Israeli red. I love the Israeli and the Lebanese wines. Um, I find them very robust, but not quite as robust as the Aussie and the Kiwi wines. Um, and also my daughter works there. So, <laughs> Oh, I did not know that. That's fabulous. I've been to Cicada so many times recently, I am within reason, right? Within yeah. the limits and the regulations. But I didn't know she yes. was there. Yes, she works there. She's a, she's a chef. She works oh. in the kitchen there. Wow, that. That's why I go back because the food is so good there. Thank you. (laughs) And I look forward to us going there together. And I haven't tried that many Australian, not Australian, Israeli wines. 
Um, so I do look forward to you introducing me to those at a time in the future. Yeah, I look forward to that too. Great. So let's go into your career background. You are Australian and you graduated from ANU. Is that the Australian National University? Yes. And you graduated in arts and law, I think around 1988. So tell us about the years like before that, actually growing up in, in Australia and what it was like for you. And what did you want to be when you were a child? Right. Okay. Well, I grew up in northern New South Wales, um, a bit south of Byron Bay, which is really a beautiful part of the world. Beaches, rainforests, very undeveloped in those days, especially. My dad was in the beef cattle industry, so um, uh, I was close to, you know, people who were farming and and literally cowboys. Um, (laughs) But I did enjoy school. I loved school. I think I always aspired to being a professional of some kind with an international, you know, some kind of international angle, though I I couldn't, you know, put my finger on exactly what it was. I I was very lucky, I think, in in the timing, you know, the times that I grew up um, when the Australian government sort of decided to, you know, turn to Asia and decide that our future lay in Asia. So that even from primary school, elementary school onwards, I mean, we studied all about Asian cultures. And then in high school, I, I took Indonesian um, and then I had the opportunity to come to Japan as an exchange student. Um, and so after that, I went back, I, I you know, took the combined degree. I studied um, Japanese, Japanese history and law and, you know, then, then qualified in Sydney. Wow. Okay. So unlike us in New Zealand, we did not study about Asia or Japan at all in our uh, geography or any other um, lessons at school, but you had that in Australia. That's really amazing. So that's what sort of led you then to think about Japan and then the connection there between Japan and law. What was that specifically, you know, to bring you to bring you through to Japan eventually? Was there something that you honed in on or was it through perhaps studying the history there that, that led you into think, thinking more about law? Yeah, I, well, I think it was a couple of things. One is that, you know, when you're in, in high school or even university, one doesn't always know precisely, you know, what career um, to pursue. Uh, law seemed like a, a good, healthy option. <laughs> but um, in addition to that, that was a time of really great, you know, really significant Japanese investment into Australia, um, into the re- resources and into the property sector, much as what's happening now with China. Um, and so it, it seemed like a pretty, you know, good opportunity to me to combine those two disciplines, as, as it were. Right. So were you sort of aware of those in your environment? It must have been something that triggered you in terms of being quite open to what you saw in media or around you, because linking those things is probably not a natural thing, I would think. I think maybe there's, was there something that also helped you in any way? Were there any other lawyers or people working in those industries? Or was it indeed, in fact, you know, affecting your, your dad and the beef cattle industry there too? Was there something that triggered that connection? You know, again, it was just the sort of confluence of circumstances, really. I mean, I must say that at ANU, uh, there were only two of us at that time, 1983, you know, to 88. There were only two of us doing the combined Japanese and law program. A lot of other people were doing economics and law, uh, sorry, economics and Asian studies. But, you know, the faculty was great. There was a lot of career-oriented activity and I, I, somehow I just could see that it would, I just imagined that it would come together. Fantastic. I think that's really great. And I, I did Japanese and law as well, but that was several years later. And um, I think it was because really somebody mentioned to me that it would be a good thing to do in combination. And I'd never really thought of it. So I'm really interested to hear that. And ANU is still very, very good university. And we hear a lot about it. And so when you graduated ANU, you became a solicitor in Sydney, I think, and you worked there for about a year before coming to Japan. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, You know, uh, I had the good luck to get a job with a good Sydney firm that had a very, very strong banking and finance practice that was interested in, you know, the Japanese, inbound Japanese market. I was also lucky to meet a mentor um, that I guess we'll talk about later, but who encouraged me to, you know, maybe find a way to come to Honest Economist to Japan to try and cement those relationships. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had, I had a great experience there. You know, I 
honestly, when I left school, when I left uh, university, I don't think I really understood what a mortgage was, but by, by God, by the end of it, I did. So. <laughs> and they're horrible things that hang over us all our lives, aren't they? Exactly. That's right. I was going to ask you what your most vivid memory was from those days in Sydney as a solicitor or a newbie lawyer, but I, I'm I'm hearing from you that it was this mentor that you meet and met, and I would really like to actually ask you about that now, uh, so that we don't forget it later. And um, tell me a bit more. Who was this person? Who was this person? Well, this was a gentleman who was the managing partner of the firm um, at the time. He, he was quite a legend in the legal community in Sydney. He, he was and and. This has been a distinguishing feature of other mentors that I've had who literally just threw a file at you and said, okay, um, you know, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a sale and purchase of, you know, a huge retail property in Sydney. Go away and do it. And, you know, the, at the, like, you know first of all, there are tears. <laughs> yes. um, but that person would then step in and coach you and help you and fix your mistakes. But just having this sort of, you know, confidence, um, but also knowing that in order to really teach people and train people, you have to give them responsibility and that's the only way they'll, they will learn. So it's a, it's a matter of sort of shaping up quickly, but with support and encouragement. And that's, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. Are you still in touch with this? Oh, chat? yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. We're in touch. Good. And every, every time he comes to Japan, we, we catch up. So, Yay. Yeah. I'd love to meet him next time. And was he significant then in, in having you move to Japan? Did he help you in that way? Or was it somebody else? Or yeah, what, I mean, how did that happen? again, he encouraged it and was the sort of person who was always thinking about opportunities um, and not just in terms of dollars and cents, but how to grow people, send them on secondment. And so his idea was to for me to find a secondment position in, in Japan, which I did pretty quickly and I don't want to get ahead of the interview, but lo and behold, I did come to Japan. Mm. But what I discovered was, and perhaps, you know, there should have been a bit of a bit more thinking about it, the firm, the firm that I came to had nothing at all to do with Australia. It wasn't, didn't have clients investing in the in the, uh, the resources or the real estate sector in, in Australia. They were purely a securities firm. Right. And that firm at the time was an up and coming firm. They had, I think literally at one point they had no bank no junior Bangoshi. So again, I, I sort of had to really fill the breach almost and work almost like a Bengoshi. Bengoshi being a Japanese lawyer, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, not realizing it at the time that this was a great opportunity for me, but I just had to sort of survive um, in, you know, turning myself now into a securities lawyer, um, doing bond offerings, overseas bond offerings for, Jap- for um, Japanese corporates looking to raise money from the international bond market. And also, you know, in those days, client, well, the clients of, of that particular firm were mostly domestic Japanese brokerages. You know, this is a long time ago. English wasn't necessarily widely spoken. Um, <laughs> so I, I pretty much spent three years, you know, in a pretty demanding environment um, working in Japanese. And without realizing it at the time, again, you know, this did become an asset for my sort of next steps in my career. There you go. That's the word, right? It's the asset thing. And you didn't notice it at the time. But it's turned out to be, I mean, if, probably if you hadn't done that securities law expertise work at that time, you may not have gone down that path. But that's kind of where it solidified itself, right? From It did. Yeah, from what you thought it might have been a, a, a firm that would have Japan-Australian links, and it didn't. And here you are thrown into doing something completely different. I'm sure you, at times you thought you wanted to pack your bag and come back to Australia. Well, there were. There were those times, definitely. But by that point, I had met my future husband, so I had, ah. a, I had an incentive to stay in Japan. <laughs> well, there we go. That is so good. So there is a multiple benefits of you coming to Japan and doing something different, right? That's right. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And so I think at another time you were in a, another UK firm in Tokyo and also they had you in their New York office. So where did that fit in? Where was that sort of going to the UK firm and, and being able to work in the in New York as well? Sure. Okay. 
So, you know, without wanting to overcomplicate things, um, my husband is a New Yorker and our, my, our long-term goal was to get sort of eventually to New York. Right. Um, in order to do that, I felt that I needed to sort of find a firm that had a New York presence where I could potentially, um, you know, find a, find a position. So I approached the UK firm, the, at the time managing partner here in, in Tokyo, mm. um, and he, he gave me a job. Um, in those days, in those days you could do it. You could call someone up and get a job. Really? Yeah. But, um, interestingly, so with that, I became a a UK, um, securities lawyer with a a very heavy focus on convertible bond offerings by, again, Japanese corporate. And we would represent the underwriters in that. And very interestingly, at the time in the, in the office at the time, no one else spoke Japanese. And in fact, it was actually sort of looked down upon that, oh, mm. well, you're, you're a linguist, not a lawyer. Oh, it, it was literally those days of a completely different mindset, whereas now I think it's difficult to get a job in Tokyo if you don't speak Japanese. So true. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was a fabulous experience. And, and the, the partner who gave me that job also has become a lifelong mentor who also just, you know, threw, you know, threw, threw me in at the deep end. And, but, but again, any time of the night or day, if I called, he would be there and he would have a solution, um, help me out of difficult, you know, difficult spots that I might be in. And again, is someone that I've stayed, you know, on very good terms with up until the present day. Um, I think, you know, just to delve into that job a little bit. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, it was very... It was quite tough, pretty mm. intense, because the issuers were always, you know, they were doing the offering to raise funds and they had some commitment that they needed the funds for. So it was quite high pressure. It was quite, yes. quite a high, high pressure job. But the part of it that I enjoyed the most was, you know, the due diligence of the companies, the issuers, that you had to go in and examine every angle of the company and look under the carpet and understand and, and analyze their financial statements. And, and that was just absolutely fascinating to get a look at some very interesting and, and quite important Japanese companies um, and how they operate at the time. That's the one aspect of the job that I do miss today. Right. But is that where the compliance sort of digging in under that due diligence, was that the compliance and regulatory uh, seed was sown around those dates when you were with that firm? That's a very good question and now that you mention it I think perhaps there that there is a connection right because I would often find it my job to say there's an irregular transaction here what what was this all about And, and sometimes that question was not well appreciated and sometimes it meant that the deal couldn't go ahead because it was an issue Mm. Mm. and I wasn't popular Sometimes we're not popular though, right? When we when we have to give the answers that some people do not want to hear about. But it could, if you hadn't um, you know, found those uh, anomalies, the deal could have gone ahead and something tragic could have happened even worse, correct? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. And in this day and age, you know, and and at that time as well, but you know, I think more and more um, reputation mm. and reputation risk is a huge concern for investors. Um, and so it's something that can't be taken lightly. Right. Yeah, so much. And it sounds like that time at the UK firm, which I think was sort of over quite a number of years, you know, and you also did both UK and New York bars during those times, which I don't know how you fit, fitted those in, but mm-hmm. you did. And so it sounds like they were that was really instrumental founding period for you. And then I think... If we can jump, I think you then went to a U.S. international firm. Was that still in Japan or did you come back to Japan or were what happened there? Yeah, so, okay, so the sequence, um, this (laughs) depends how long, you know, how long have we got um, my career? (laughs) Your career is fascinating. That's why I wanted to hear about this because the thing is too, Robin, is that this is going to be inspirational for others and that, that, that so much can actually happen in your career as a lawyer. You don't have to do one single thing and the world really, really is your oyster. And so that's why I'm delighted that you can talk a little bit more about your career. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thanks for putting a positive spin on it. Um, I'll just say <laughs> it's a bit convoluted, but, um, you know, I, at, at a certain point I did feel like, feel that I wanted to prioritise work-life balance 
Um, my, my children were small. So I took a role in-house with a US-based asset manager um, here in Tokyo, their Japan operation. And I, I mean, I think, you know, really it was that opportunity where I got very up close and personal with compliance. I was hired as a lawyer, but I discovered that that they were looking to um, sort of obtain a new license to do a completely new business and that all the compliance infrastructure for that new business needed to be sort of really built, built up, built out. So that was really my focus. And, and that's when I learned to sort of enjoy compliance and to see how important it was to the business and business strategy. You know, really enjoy it and think that this is something that I might want to do more of. Ah, okay. I mean, unfortunately, Lehman could have stopped to that. And I did go then to a US firm where I went back to doing securities transactions, which was great. You know, I, as I said, I, I enjoy those, but I was, I made a point of trying to keep the compliance yes. angle relevant by um, working on compliance audits and even internal investigations. I mean, there's a huge crossover because an internal investigation is usually around an ethical breach, a compliance breach. And so I tried to keep current, you know, my skills current and relevant in that area as well. Were you putting your hand up to do matters that had a compliance angle to them or were you just seeing that in, in deals that were coming across your table and you you added that in from your own initiative? What What happened there? How did you get people to know that compliance was really important to be attentioning. Yeah, I made a point of telling the, the litigators. Um, I just mm. got friendly with them. I made a point of telling them. My um, mentor from the UK firm who um, I had joined at the US firm, <laughs> see how convoluted it is. Oh, very um, good. Interesting. Yeah. So so we were, we, we were working together again and, again, he made a point of sort of putting me forward and... Um, encouraging the litigators to to use me which which they did and I'm not a litigator by any means but I do know what compliance looks like and I was able to do mm. uh, you know compliance audits and investigations wow that's really amazing I love how this mentor is weaving in and out of your life and your career and it, it's sort of really showing to me how we often follow our mentors yeah I mean look it's uh what's the right word Addictive? <laughs> no, uh, you know, it's just, it's just luck. I think you meet those, you meet those special people in your life, and they are your people, and you're their people, and you know, not to be second guess. I think, and you know, oftentimes, I think those relationships do last lifetimes. And it also means to me is that it's so important not to burn bridges and to be, you know, a good person with anybody who comes across your path because you never know when they're going to cross your path again. And if they look after you or you look after them, it's a two-way street, that something will come to you down the down the line. And I think that's the universe being good to us if we are good to people. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think that's right. I think also, you know, a mentoring relationship is a two-way relationship. So my contribution was working damn hard, getting the deals done, and, and so I think it was a pretty, it was, you know, it's a relationship of equals. I would also say that a mature person who's a mentor can overlook bad behaviour uh, along the way that might otherwise, you know, potentially poison a less um, close relationship. So, you know, I've walked away from people that were mentors. In fact, I've done it multiple times and still been able to keep that relationship going. And I think that's a reminder to us as we mentor others that, you know, people make mistakes um, and, and, and we need to be the ones that have the sort of generosity and the compassion and not to just kick someone loose because they didn't show us the degree of loyalty that we thought we would do. Mm, I see. Okay. So giving people a second chance. Yeah, I think that's important. Mm, mm. Okay. I really like that. I think that's there's probably something a lot more um, we could go into there, but I do think that's right in giving people another another go at something and also releasing people if they're not good for you and your your network and your immediate and ecosystem. I think it's important to release. Also important, yes. Yeah, release what we don't need and bring in what we do. And then um, I think at some point there too, you also had a couple of secondments to FinTech Payments Company and a, an American multinational investment bank. How do you get a secondment and multiple secondments like that? And yeah. 
What are your tips for people who want to think this is a conment gig sounds like a great thing? How did that come about? Again, I'm thinking there's a compliance tie-in here. Those roles that you're talking about, the fintech job was actually a full-time job. So I left I left the law firm. The opportunity came up um, with a US payments firm in the compliance department. And that just ticked all the boxes as far as I was concerned in look, wanting to get back into a compliance role. Um, so that indeed was a, um, a full-time job. I was there for five, six years, I think. I've lost track of time. I did have a I did have two secondments actually while I was at the US firm. One was to the pet food company. And, you know, look, there's something to be said for every secondment. You learn something. Um, (laughs) And you you have a pet, so I'm sure it was very (laughs) beneficial. And if I don't feed her that brand of pet food, um, I get in trouble from the vet. So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's a good brand, yeah. It is a good brand. So you learned something. (laughs) I did. No, but just to see how a real company... Mm. You know, um, and struggling in Japan, the struggle between, you know, it's usually the US parent and the global platform and how things are done globally with very local regulation and markets and um, market conventions and inevitably there's some tension there. And that was part of my job to help try and resolve or bridge that. So that was actually a very, very interesting role. Um, I also learned when you've, albeit, you know, dog food, um, how incredibly demanding Japanese sort of product quality demands are so that the company had a team of full-time vets who would literally take calls that were like along the lines of the kibble is a different colour this month, Mm. which was just eye-opening. And I think it's a challenge faced by every consumer products company, you know, foreign or Japanese in Japan. Your typical lawyer would not even know that unless they were in the company and knew that they had a whole team of vets <laughs> standing by to receive the customer's call. I mean, that's an amazing insight to how Japanese companies, in this case, right, had that attention to detail and the dedication to looking after their customers. That's incredible. Well, it was certainly, you know, an eye-opening for me. Um, and then I had another secondment um, to a U.S. bank for a while that was going through um, some major changes, just needed a little bit of help. But um, it was then the fintech role that really kind of occupied me for the next um, five or six years where, so I was hired into the compliance team and had the, you know, opportunity and and good luck to eventually be, you know, become the head of the department. Uh, And really it was everything I was looking for, the whole gamut of you know compliance work compliance issues from policies and procedures to training advice to the business uh handling regulatory inspections uh new license applications but above all more than anything else was just making sure the business stayed compliant and the way to do that in addition to understanding the regulation is to really understand the company and literally how the operations work so that you know, there might be a practice that's done globally because everyone wants to standardise their processes globally, obviously. Um, that's not going to work for Japan. So we have to find the tweak that's going to be the least burdensome to the business. And um, it was, a, yeah, really enjoyed myself. It sounds like I can hear it in your voice how much you enjoyed that <laughs> work. And I remember knowing you at that time and seeing you very joyful and knowing that that was something, again, I was seeing you create this compliance niche and some of us were just vaguely talking about it, but you were really getting into it. Um, and you were doing some webinars, well, not webinars, seminars, right? The old style when we would meet up in person. Um, I can remember you doing those things as well and being really involved and being a, a real poster girl, if I can say that, for compliance. I think a lot of lawyers and a lot of people, um, not just lawyers, have this view of compliance of like checking the box, you know, checklist right. and tick, 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 tick. Yes. There is that, there is that angle, although I'll, I'll, I will say that, you know what, if you can't tick all the boxes, then that's a problem and there's a reason for doing that. But it, it really is so much more. And um, like I said, you know, being very close to the, the strategy and, I mean, we've discussed this, Catherine, but... I, I did conclude. I did conclude that within any company, especially a regulated company, um, the compliance function is the more important, as between compliance and law. Um, and that's because you know, look, if you don't, if you don't get, you can't negotiate all the terms that you want in, in a contract, or 
you know, you miss something in a contract. Well, okay, so that's a problem or a potential problem. Um, if you make a compliance error, then you've got the regulators looking at you and the worst case scenario, you lose your business. Sorry, you lose your license and you can't do business. So I think I think it's because compliance, and, and this is less so in the US and the UK, probably Australia, compliance has been increasingly professionalised globally. Um, in Japan, I think that Japan is a little yet to catch up. But I just think it's because there's no sort of over, overarching view of, of compliance being a profession, profession as such. It's people who, often in Japan, it's people who were traders previously or internal audit who just found themselves in compliance. Whereas uh, in the States, I think you'd struggle to find a, a compliance officer who isn't actually a lawyer. Ah, yes, that would an, be right. Or an accountant. And some of them actually do an additional qualification, I think, in compliance, whereas that's not really in place in Japan, is it? Yeah, that's right. There are, especially in the area of anti-money laundering, which is a huge topic, very important area that's really the focus of uh, regulatory um, scrutiny. There are professional sort of anti-money laundering qualifications and, yes, other qualifications that you can get Mm. in the States, at least. Yeah, I think you're right, though, with that point you've made about compliance being a profession and that lots of lawyers are actually doing that role in other countries, but not so much in Japan, because I remember back at my one of my previous companies, we did a lot of internal investigations. And in order to do the questions to the witnesses, it really needed that talent and that skill that we learn as a lawyer to ask the right questions for those compliance ethics investigation. So I, I'm I'm really hearing you on that and that, you know, it, compliance really does need the skills of a lawyer to be acting in that role. Yeah, uh, I think it helps. I really do. Because, you know, and but every as, as with everything, you know, it's a balancing act because the compliance officers often have continuity of relationships uh, with regulators and how things are done throughout the, um, say, the financial industry in Japan. The lawyers, though, I think another value add they have is they will always actually look at the law. So when a question comes up, is is this compliant? The lawyer's instinct will be actually to look at the law, whereas, you know, the non-lawyers will, that just won't necessarily be their starting point. So true. So true. And now you're in a big Japanese firm and I'm just intrigued as to how you let yourself come to be involved in a Japanese firm. And by that, I mean, maybe it was a case of you'd done a lot of different things. You'd been on secondments, you'd worked in house, you had been at a UK firm, an international US firm. Was that the one that you, the the nut you wanted to crack or was it through relationships or how did that happen that you came over to be in this firm? And I think you've been with them nearly two years now. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was a combination of factors, uh, but for me, it was, again, related to sort of regulatory practice, you know, from the, from the law firm angle and not just one client, which you have in-house, but you know, potentially multiple clients coming, trying to enter the market and especially foreign, foreign companies, foreign market entrants, um, really struggling to make sense of the local regulation when they were trying to enter the market. So that was, that was very interesting to me, but also the, you know, extremely high caliber of the, um, the Japanese lawyers in, in the fintech practice at, at the firm where I work. Yeah. Wow. What do you love most about that role? I mean, it's a pleasure to go to work every day with really smart professionals. Yeah. Um, not not that it's the first time, but it is a pleasure. You know, it's it's kind of it's an opportunity to distill almost everything that I've done and in my career to date in a really focused way that I like. You know, I like to think um, can make a difference and potentially a big difference. So that when a when a company is looking to get a crypto exchange license or a funds transfer license having actually, well, at least in the funds transfer space, actually run a compliance department, knowing precisely what the processes need to be for KYC, for example. I mean, I can tell them precisely what they need to do within the scope of the regulation. So they're not running around shooting in the dark, trying to figure out, oh gosh, what, you know, what exactly do we need to do? I I can tell them. Mm. And so that, and you know, just to qualify, I'm not qualified to advise on Japanese law, but I work with I yeah. work. I work with my my colleagues, and I can give those sort of practical insights mm. um, 
this is what this is how you know this is how you have to do it so it's a culmination it's yeah. a culmination of all of that you've done and it's really you've got these brilliant minds that you're working with but they're also benefiting from you and the practical experience you've had in firms and companies and that experience is really helping them so it sounds like a very good marriage well I mean I like to think so um <laughs> you know they're they're all Thanks. they're all you know really smart really smart people who um also are definitely commercial commercially minded you know they're not just sort of they're not going to just write you a strict black letter of the law advice they'll try to keep it commercial but yeah I think between I think the combination of of me being able to say well that's what the regulation says what it actually means you know in ter- operational terms is you need this this you know this process and that process mm. and down and and actually you need to do screening against this particular database not that particular database it's very practical um contribution that I you know I like to think that I can make and you've been with them for a couple of years coming up and you had to endure a pandemic uh, and still enduring that through that time has anything changed in the way that you all interact and do your practice as a as a result of the pandemic have there been some challenges that you've overcome and things that I guess if they were challenges and you've overcome them that you're going to keep them um, as your new style of working you know luckily the firm um you know, the Japanese firms are pretty forward-looking and uh, the big firms especially, and actually they're pretty relaxed about working from home. But, um, yeah, nothing's really changed. I was the one that had to adapt because I was the old, <laughs> I was the old school thinker of... Going to the office. Yeah, you've got to go to the <laughs> office, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I've really enjoyed working from home. I think in Good. some ways I feel more efficient because you can work according to your own rhythms and other things that you need to do. I, I do like to... Though when we have a conference call with a client, I do like to be in the same room as my Japanese colleagues so that we can have chats and I, if need be, I can explain things to them face to face. So there's the odd time you are in the office, but mostly working remotely at the moment. Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, I aim to go in sort of one or two days a week and hit the government's 70-30 target. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need to abide, oblige, you know, oblige <laughs> and be compliant, shall we say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm really interested then in your routine and how you, you know, you're talking about sometimes being in the office to be compliant, but The things that you do, such as, you know, those things that you do at the beginning of the day and the morning to get yourself started, what does that look like? And are you keeping kind of regular hours um, and when do you shut your laptop? Well, you you know, (laughs) um, to be honest, my laptop's always open and I just work around it. And in between that, um, the typical things that I do in the day is I will will have a cigarette first thing in the morning, but usually it's just an (laughs) e-cigarette. (laughs) <laughs> you know I, it's surprising you know how much work there is with a dog between going to the vets and get, having the dog trimmed and you know I go to the gym I try to work out a lot because I've sort of finally reached reached that age where it becomes you know like yeah you really have to do it you know <laughs> so I, I did work out a lot um I also I've had this lifelong ambition to learn French Ooh. And my husband and I are taking French lessons. Um, if, if anyone tries to tell you French is an easy language, they're lying. You think it's easy? It's a, no, I'm saying if anyone tells you it's easy, they're lying. It's oh, a I see. Language. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, so it's a difficult language. I know. I tried it at school for two years and was a dismal failure. I remember bonjour tout le monde when the teacher came into the room. Why is she saying hello to the world? But that was <laughs> that was how she greeted the class. And yeah. I was really no good at French. How long have you been studying? Uh, about a year. So we we do we go to a little French school over in Ebisu and we love it. I mean, I do love it. Um, just to have an insight, just to have some visibility to a completely different culture. You know, it's fascinating having basically spent my entire life, well, I mean, I did live in the US but for a while, but, you know, sort of Anglo-Saxon cultures or Asian cultures mm. to, to see a European culture. Have you um, been to France? Yeah, I have. I have absolutely loved it. Mm, me too. I tried to use French, but it didn't go down so well. Oh, it's hard. It's like <gasps> couldn't couldn't they just come up with just, just one single word for it? <laughs> No. How do you? What's the Jap, What's the not the French word? What is the French word for lawyer? Uh, it's 
avocat or avocat. Ah, right. That's right. It sounds like avocado, but it's not. Yeah. Okay. And how, and how do you say I'm a lawyer in French? Oh, now you're telling me. Uh, je, suis avo- je suis avocat. Oh, it sounds nice. Wow, that is so good. I love that you've taken up something um, different, right? You did Indonesian, you said earlier on, and Japanese, French. Wow, that's amazing, as well as English, of course. Um, that's really, really great. So you, your laptop's on all day, and you're working around it, and you go to the, you've got your pet, you've got your lovely dog, Sadie, and um, you keep yourself busy now with French. I love that. That's really good. So so French is almost, it's challenging, but it's a way of also relaxing for you and time with your husband. It is, yes, and it's. I, I'm glad I insisted that he come along because we can. He makes me practice actually, so we can practice together. He's yeah, diligent. So oh, great! Oh, yeah, great! And diligent. so I guess, yeah, I was going to say if we were at Cicada um, and had had a couple of your recommended uh, Israeli wines, we'd be we'd be talking more philosophically now. And so I really want to dig down and ask you about a few other things, such as you know the traits that you have that you're most proud of? And I'm thinking resilience might be one of them, but what kinds of things are the successful points of Robin Nadler? Yeah, I mean, I I am resilient. Um, I think probably all of us have to be. That probably almost goes without saying. Um, I think something that I, I feel that I'm able to kind of bring to the table. And I think it might just be a matter of experience, Catherine, to be honest, is, and I'm, I'm sure I couldn't have done this when I was a young lawyer, but um, getting quickly to the nub of an issue because mm-hmm. someone will come to you and think they have a problem or they, you know, they're not sure if they have a problem or there's confusion around what the com- problem is. And I'm quite, I'm quite adept at honing precisely in on this is the problem um, and Again, being the one that has to say it. <laughs> um, is that like attention to detail or is it more uh, um, you're very focused? What sort of a trait is that? Is that um, mm, inquisitive or um, t- having tenacity? What do you, what's your finger point on that for this, the kind of trait that is? Well, it's, it's not always a likable trait. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm the first to admit I think I have quite a critical mindset. Ah, that's it. You know, in all aspects of life. Mm. So I'll be the first to pick out a fault and say, you know, that's not right or there's a problem there and and just sort of see it. Maybe others see it, but they're too polite to say it. I don't know. But um, and then with I think with experience and in the workplace, and I, I should also add that I'm pretty critical of myself. So it's not, you know, it's not universally uh, something that's used against everyone else but yeah I mean with experience you get to say hold on this is where the risk is this is the problem critical mindset and critical of yourself but how do you encourage yourself what how do you bring out that more positive mindset I know even if you've got a critical mindset and you're seeing the problems you're also coming up with solutions so when you do that with yourself what how do you find the solution to get yourself further forward and encourage yourself um that's a very very good question you know honestly I've learned to be accepting like it, it's okay you know you can't fix everything some things I think are just entrenched they're part of your DNA I'm not sure whether to criticize myself for being critical or for the <laughs> things I'm being critical of <laughs> so mm. it's a complete it's just a complete conundrum but you know I'm just like it doesn't really matter in the scheme of things not sweating the small stuff yeah it, thank you that's it yeah, yeah. and know. not things that really don't make a difference to the outcome. And it's all, as you say, it's part of your DNA, but it's actually part of what people need in this world. And then some, there are only certain people who can do it. And so you've got a speciality in that way. I think there's a, a positivity to being, having a critical mindset. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I think so. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't you, say. Ask my husband. I will ask Peter. I will ask him sometime, but what about a word or a theme to guide you for a year each year? Do you have something like that? I think you know from previous chats I've had that I do, but I'm interested to know if you have something. Well, yeah. I mean, every year my theme is, you know, lose 10 kilos. Ah. <laughs> but it hasn't happened Be yet. Be healthy. Be healthy as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't happened yet. No, I just, I've just kind of narrowed things down a lot and it's, um, it's getting to the point of really big major focus on physical and mental health 
Yes. And if it doesn't support those two things, then I try actually stay away from it. So I think you're being intentional about health. Oh, very. Yeah. Yeah. So intentional is my word, but I think you, I can hear you saying you're being intentional about how you want to live a healthy life because it's going to make a difference, isn't it, in the future? And being lawyers, we, in any profession, but lawyers, we need to be on our game all the time, on the top of our game. And being healthy is really important. Well, it is. And, you know, I think we're all getting to the, that stage in life where, you know, we see our parents getting elderly and having health problems. And, you know, we are aware that some of their problems may be self-inflicted. They didn't take care of themselves. Mm. And it's a real shame. Yeah. And I, you know, for my sake, my husband's sake, my sake of my kids and my dog, um, I do want to stay as healthy as possible for long, as long as possible. Yep, I agree. What if you weren't a lawyer? What would you be? Have you ever considered giving up the law, Robert? <laughs> well, you know, given that I didn't didn't really know what being a lawyer was all about or whether I should become one, I, I didn't have any clear ideas of other options. But I did, I did at some point pass the public service exam uh, for federal civil servants, and I was offered a job with the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet mm. at the time, which is it's, just, it's quite a um, important government department in Australia, very close to the centres of power, obviously. And I didn't take it because I thought, well, no, I'm going to be a lawyer. I think in hindsight, if I had taken it, it would have been a very interesting career. But then I'd be a public servant in Canberra, and I wouldn't have had the interesting, you know, no. experience that I that I you have wouldn't had. have had the frolicking around that you have done so far, <laughs> I think. And who's who's a politician you look up to? Is someone like Jacinda Ardern on your radar, or there's some? Is there somebody else in Australia or elsewhere who you look up to as someone out of the public service at the top of the public service? Top of the public service. That's a hard one. Um, they're all so flawed, but it's <laughs> it's hard to be. I mean, I I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen. I voted for Joe Biden. I admire him and respect him. I think he's pulling the country together um, and doing a good job of it after the all the divisions. And um, we'll see. Yes. But right. Right. As of this moment, um, yeah, he's at the top of my list. Great. Okay. Very very good. What's the wisest thing that someone's ever said to you? Is it somebody who was a lawyer? Is it your husband? Is it um, some intuition from your doggy? Is it what? What's the wisest thing and who said it to you? Okay. Okay. So um, it was my father and I think, and actually I, I think about it a lot, which is when everyone else is running, walk, and when everyone else is walking, run. Ooh. I have chills. When did that, when did he tell you that? Oh, I mean, when I was probably about five years old. Really? And you remember? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things. Everyone in my family, even even my husband says it today. How do you use that in your daily now? Well, it could be anything, but, you know, I think it's, I think it's just this idea that, you know, be very careful of the herd and the herd mentality. Um, I guess I would hesitate today to to buy any cryptocurrency, for example, thinking of that message. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the mining of minerals and things hanging around that currency at the moment, isn't there? There's quite mm. a big topic there. Wow. How about the reverse then? The Probably the worst piece of advice you've received. And sometimes I've found that the worst piece can be something that you turn into a positive that you don't do what they've said. Have you, can you think of anything that's been not so good advice you've received? I think it's when people say to you, oh, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that because, you know, so and so will think badly of you or, you know, it's not appropriate or it's not done. I think those, every time someone says something like that, it should be a red flag that that's actually, it's probably the right time to do it mm. because it means someone's judging you. I mean, there's a time and a place for everything, but. You know, I just think you have to go with your own intuition as as far as um, what you do. Right. And so knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently when you're starting out or would you do what you've done exactly the same, do you think? I think it. I think it's, it's more on the personal level. I, I mean, to make it sort of relevant to, to this discussion, I think areas where it can, could be relevant for us here in Japan is when someone says, well, you know, this is how you have to behave at a meeting meaning don't say anything, be demure, um, you know, that, that's wrong. In fact, you, 
if you feel like you have something to say, you, you should absolutely say it. Right. And would that be kind of the advice you'd suggest to younger lawyers or law students coming up the ranks? Yes, I absolutely would. Um, in fact, the quickest the quickest way to actually sabotage a career is to not speak up because you will be overlooked. The trade-off to balance against that is you have to have something of value to say. So, you know, that requires some work and some study and, and, and to think about what to say. It's not like magically. I mean, there are those lucky, very, very smart and very vocal people who can just, you know, are very quick to ad lib and uh, everyone sort of bows down before them. But I mean, I, would, I think the working assumption is that you should say something and it would be a very, a very sort of have a badly informed partner or colleague who would criticize you afterwards. Um, if, if you do get criticized afterwards, most likely it's because you showed them up and they're not the per- people you want to be working with anyway. But, you know, you have to do your homework. You have to be prepared and think before you speak. Yeah, not to speak for the sake of speaking, but... Yeah. Speak with intention. Right. right. And when you have something to say, and I always think don't don't turn up to a meeting unless you've got to ask, you ask a question or make a comment. And you should, if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be in the meeting is one of my philosophies. And I still bring that through to webinars or anything I'm in. I will make a comment. I will make a question. Yeah. And it's not just for the sake of ha- having people hear my voice. It's because we're at that meeting. Why are we spending our valuable time there without having some uh, inspiration from what the speaker's been saying. We should be having our presence heard by asking a question, making a comment. Agree. Totally agree. Thank you. You you, you said that much more eloquently than I did, but yes, no, exactly. I, I was, I was um, listening so hard to you, I almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think what you've said has been marvellous. And I also think as we were talking about the law students and uh, of the future and the lawyers of the future, what about the law firms of the future and what the profession should be focusing on more from now? I think you've got a really good perspective position there to be able to see into the future. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you think are the challenges and practices now and what lawyers and the business of law should be looking to in the future? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think as with everything else in in life, um, I think it's technology that's driving the changes in, you know, law firm practice. Um, Even financial services, traditional financial services are changing with technology, outsourcing, you know, so many aspects of, um, uh, you know, business, business life are changing drastically with, with technology. So it is going to be challenging, especially I think for older lawyers to get their heads around, get their heads around this and what it means for, you know, um, contracts and regulation and what have you. Won't older lawyers just ask the younger lawyers to help them out? Do you think that they need to do more than that and actually get empowered and start learning well I think they will I think they'll I mean there'll be an element of of that um but it will be it will be very challenging so for example just to give you one example where you know non-fungible tokens which I won't you know I won't go into but they're you know it's just code basically and that code can be sold potentially distributed maybe security can be taken over it Copyright is going to be embedded in these tokens and, and the assets are going to be sold that way, title to assets. Uh, I think unless you really understand at a very granular level, like what exactly are these rights? How are they constituted? What does this code even do? I think it's going to be hard to um, to practice law around it without understanding. It, it, not, not that it can't be understood, but I, I think in order to do your job as a lawyer, I think you, you're going to need a a good strong baseline understanding of all this. And is that just with fintech or do you think that crosses over all aspects of law that lawyers really need to get together with a coding and become friends and hold hands with coding? I don't know that they need to go down to the level of code in in every case, but it is relevant, say, for cryptocurrency, which is all code, tokens that I mentioned just so much is driven now online, um, online commerce, online solutions. Yes. You know, it's it's really taking up more and more of our economy and our daily lives. So, you know, we're not, I think it's maybe Japan where there's still that very solid traditional manufacturing base and traditional operating companies. Um, it's different, but it, it is definitely changing here. Wow. So what do we really then need to be doing now? 
in order to be ready for the future? I think we need to, um, you know, be close to, to the trends. Study, look, try to learn. You know, when you hear a word or a concept that you, you don't know, look it up. There's a lot of Emperor's New Clothes too. Like not everyone actually knows what this is and I include myself in that. Um, but just try to figure it out. You might be the first one or the only one on a team or within your law firm who, who's done that. Yeah, that sounds like one of my previous guests. She was talking about um, seeing a gap and seeing round corners and, you know, established a, a legal tech practice and also a, a hydrogen practice. And no one had thought about it. And now it's a big, big thing in, in where she's working. But that's the go. kind of, is that the kind of thing? It's, it's looking to the future. Where do we think there might be places we can play? Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to say um, exactly what it is or what it's going to be. Um, I think to your point, um, your your other guest, uh, someone who can look around corners. Again, not everyone can do that, but keep an eye out for, for, for potential opportunities. Mm. See what's happening um, when no one else is going. You know, make it your own. Uh, that's how opportunities arise. Perfect. And not just be comfortable where we are, but continue to advance ourselves in that way. Absolutely. Great. Well, was there anything today that we haven't covered that you wanted to talk about, Robin, or anything that you've talked about and you'd like to re-emphasize? No, Catherine, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for, have, thanks for having me on the show. It's so good, but we haven't finished yet because <laughs> the final Super 6 is coming up and that, that is the quick fire round of six questions that I have with everybody who comes on the show to talk about before we wind up. And so the first question is, yeah. if I gave you a million yen in Japanese cash, right? And whereabouts in Japan, obviously compliant with com um, compliance here, a million yen in Japanese cash, where would you go to spend it? Your favorite store or destination or wherever? Yeah, I realized this is a bit of a trick question because I can take it and convert it into US dollars and I would go to Macy's, Macy's in New York. That is brilliant thinking. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> That's really super. I would do the same, actually. I'd love to go to Macy's. Tell me about a podcast or a book that you read or you are listening to or you um, have read and listened to that you recommend. I love to listen to true crime podcasts, and there's a bunch of them. Um, I love, you know, mysteries and unsolved crime. The one that I like, it's in fact, it's um, done by an Australian guy, anonymous host. No one knows who he is, but it's called Case File. And cool. I really like that because it's a mix of Australian cases and like US cases. Oh, I love that. You really know good. what? You're going to like Conning the Con. Oh. It's got an Australian and New Zealand aspect to it. And I think you would really like it. So do listen to that one. It's very, very good. Frightening, but very good. <laughs> Okay, so you're stuck on a desert island, Robin, and I think I know the answer to this, actually. You need to bring one person, one item, and one food. What and who are they? Well, again, it's a tough question. You only give me a choice of one person. I have, but I think I know what's coming. <laughs> well, just for the sake um, of, of um, answering the question, I'll say it's the dog. I'll take the dog, only because if I leave, she'll be bereft. So I need to take her with me. Um, it's out of care and concern. Yeah, for her well-being. My husband can look after himself. Um, I would take my iPhone because I'm utterly addicted to it, assuming we have Wi-Fi service. Of course we do, yes. And then um, just watermelon, which I love. And oh. it's, it's that time of year. It's just, oh, I love it. Oh, lovely. And what about a famous person or celebrity who you have met or would like to meet? Yeah, I'd like to meet Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I. <gasps> Wow. Why? Well, she was a very, very independent, strong ruler. People tried to control her. She stepped around them, did her own thing. She was very brave. She was in danger and, again, found a way around it. So I'd love to talk to her about all those challenges and how, mm. she, you know, how she survived. Interesting, interesting figure. Wow. I love that. What's on your bedside cabinet then? And is it a book about Elizabeth I? I've read many books about her, but on my bedside table is my iPhone watch charger and my iPhone charger because I actually, I, but I read all my, I do read all my books on my phone. So you could think of it as a huge high stack of books. 
I am thinking of that. I can see it. I can visualize it. And what about a place that you visited and would love to go there post pandemic when we can all fly again? Yeah, honestly, I would just like to go back to Australia, the most beautiful beach, the most beautiful beaches, the nicest part of the world. Um, I would say Port Macquarie, New South Wales, which is close to where I was born and brought up and where my remote ancestor was sent as a convict from England over 100 years ago. Wow. That sounds amazing. Have you, you've been there before? Oh yeah. Yeah. So you go back there many times. You go back. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you the bonus question, which is something about (laughs) you that others don't know or something about you that I don't know. Well, okay. Um, I did mention that my father was in the beef cattle cattle industry. So as a result, I do know how to crack a whip, how to ride a, ride a horse, how to herd cattle and how to milk a cow. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That is amazing. Wow. Wow. I love it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Robin, then for sharing your stories and my goodness, all your tips and nuggets of advice and insights, especially into compliance. I, you really blew me away there. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. My pleasure, Catherine. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. And I was thinking how the Legal Eagle listener here would be able to connect with you. Maybe they could do that through me or you know, via email to me. Would that be a good thing? That would be great. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll put that in the notes. And so I'm going to finish up there. And I I think we've had a fantastic conversation about many different things. I'm so grateful for you to coming on the show. Um, We're now halfway through with you being guest number five in a series of 10 in this first season. I'm aiming for 10 legal eagle lawyers. Uh, And I really want to thank you for your honesty and your frankness. I did say at the top that you would be very frank and not sugarcoat anything. And I think you've done exactly that. You're an inspiration to me personally. You really are. And I really thank you for sharing your journey. Um, And it's been just wonderful listening to you. So for my listeners, please do like this episode and subscribe subscribe to Lawyer On Air. Drop us a quick review if you can. That really helps Lawyer On Air be seen by many people. And do go ahead and share it with another person who you think would enjoy listening and be inspired to live a wonderful lawyer lady life. So that's all for now. I'll see you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. It's my passion to share my stories of amazing legal ladies, so please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I would love to connect with you, so jump on over to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter or Insta, where you can find me. The links are in the show notes below. Well, that's all from me today, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.